Hi, my name is Mark Okrand. What I do most of the time is I oversee the creation of closed caption television programs uh, for both local stations and net networks and cable and so forth. But I also created the Vulcan and Klingon dialogue heard in Star Trek 2, 3, 4, and 5, and so forth. The whole connection with linguistics in Star Trek for me actually started not with Star Trek 3, but with Star Trek 2. There's a short scene in Star Trek 2 where Spock and Savick talk to each other um, on, the, on the Enterprise. And as originally shot, the two characters, the two actors, are speaking in English. But they wanted to change it so that they're speaking Vulcan to each other, and they just put in subtitles. But rather than reshooting the whole thing, what they decided to do was just dub in dialogue that would sound very different from English but lap, uh, match the lip movements that were already there. So they figured they would hire a linguist, someone who was good at phonetics, you know, the, the speech sounds, who, who would know what sounds look alike and what sounds look different and make the lips match. And I told them I thought that was a great idea. So I made up these four lines of Vulcan. <laughs> And after I did that, I got in my car and was driving away, and I was thinking, oh, I, I just taught Mr. Spock how to speak Vulcan. I thought, that's it, I can die now, everything is okay. <laughs> and I thought that would be the end of my, my connection with Star Trek, because wasn't, I wasn't counting on it in the first place, you know. About a year and a half later, I got a call from Harv Bennett, who said, we're making a new movie, Star Trek III. The bad guys, the villains, are going to be the Klingons. He says, I think it would be a good idea for the Klingons to have their own language. Would you like to do that? You did the Vulcan, would you like to do the Klingon? And every once in a while, you're presented with a decision in life that's not very difficult to make. And that was one of them, so I said, yes. And so that's how I made up the Klingon. But the Klingon and the Vulcan was a very, very different experience because the Vulcan, as I say, was ma matching sounds to lip movements already on the film. Whereas Klingon, we started from scratch. When it came time to make up the language, I had to make a couple of decisions. I had to decide what it's going to sound like. I had to decide what the grammar was going to be like. I had to make up a lot of words for the language. Uh, for the words, actually, that was the easy part, because I only had to make up the dialogue that was in the film. The original intent was not to make up a full language that you could talk about anything in and carry on great philosophical discussions. The original intent was to make up lines of dialogue for Star Trek III. So if the word was in the film, in the script for the film, I would make up a word. And if the word wasn't in the script for the film, I probably didn't make up the word. But to start with the sounds, because I had to figure out what it's going to sound like, there was a couple of, of influences. The most important one was Star Trek The Motion Picture. We've never heard Klingon before. In the original series, they didn't speak Klingon. We like the Enterprise. We, we really do. That sagging old rust bucket is designed like a garbage scow. Half the quadrant knows it. That's why they're learning to speak Klingonese. <laughs> but we then hear no examples of Klingonese. We don't know what it, what it sounds like. So the only Klingon we have from the original series is people's names. There's Kang and Kor and Koloth and a woman named Mara. That's it. But those are real Klingon words because those are their names. So that has to be incorporated into the, into the language. But in Star Trek, the motion picture at the beginning, there's real Klingon. There's real sentences with real subtitles. So that has to be incorporated into the language, too. Now, I came to, to Star Trek after that, because I started with Star Trek II. But the Klingon for Star Trek, the motion picture, I found out afterwards, I didn't know this when I was first starting my work, was actually made up by, by James Doohan, the actor who plays Scotty. And it was spoken by Mark Leonard, who's the actor who normally plays uh, Sarek, Spock's father. But in this film, he was playing the... the, the captain and commander of the, the Klingon ship. So he was the first speaker of Klingon. So I did the best I could and listened to the lines over and over and over again and wrote them down. And those are real Klingon sentences. Those are, those are words. Those are uh, the translations, what they mean. Those are the sounds. If it was a three-syllable uh, Klingon sentence, I kind of imposed a structure on it. I had to decide, OK, it's three syllables. Is that one word or two words or three words? I, just, I would just decide, that's two words. The first two syllables are one word, and the third one is another word, or the other way around, or just cuz, just because I had to start someplace. But I also made an inventory of the sounds that were used in there, because all of those sounds in the motion picture also had to be in the language that I was coming up with, because it's the same language. So for example, one of the phrases in Star Trek, the motion picture, is, is we cha. So there's a, those sounds, I started making a list, an inventory of what the sounds are. So we cha, there's a, there's a w, 
there's a, I'm putting them in different parts of the chart here. There's a e, there's a ch, and the way linguists write that's a number of ways linguists write that. But one of them is c with a little thing on it. That's a ch. There's a a. Ah. Okay, so we cha. I'm writing them all over the place here because I'm going to end up filling out a full chart. Those four sounds have to be sounds in the Klingon that I'm coming up with because they were in the in the original film. So I charted out all the sounds from the original film. And there was some, but not enough. I had to add more to make Klingon be a real language. Otherwise, all the words would sound alike because there'd be so few sounds. So in adding the sounds, I paid attention to a couple of things. One was that according to the script for Star Trek III, uh, Klingon is a guttural language. It says in the script that Krug, who's the main heavy, the main Klingon villain in the film, says in his guttural Klingon, and then there's the line. Well, if, if Krug is supposed to speak in guttural Klingon, I better add some guttural sounds. So I added a kh sound and a kh sound, which is different, and so on. Uh, I also intentionally violated some rules of human languages. And what I mean by that is this. Human languages are very patterned. There's no 100% rules but there's a lot of tendencies and more likely than nots and so forth. And certain sounds tend to be together in a language and certain sounds tend not to be in the same language. So since Klingon is not a human language, it didn't have to follow those human language rules. So I could put sounds together in Klingon that normally would not be in the same language. So for example, in, in Klingon, there's the sound V, V, Okay. And usually in a language, if there's a V sound, there's also an F sound, not in Klingon. Why? Because usually that's the way it works in human languages, and Klingon is not a human language. In Klingon, there's a, there's a, a T sound, uh, and there's also a D in Klingon, but the D doesn't match the T. You make it with a, using, putting your tongue in a different place. That's unusual from a human language point of view. Therefore, that's a good thing to do in Klingon, and so on. There's a number of things like that. We're just violating the rules of human phonetics or, or, the, or the tendencies of human phonetics. I came up with the inventory of sounds for Klingon. There's no sound in Klingon that doesn't occur somewhere in some human language somewhere or other, but the collection of sounds is unique to Klingon, and it's weird from a, from a human language point of view. Well, in addition to the sounds, I had to worry about the grammar of the language. You can't just throw words together in some way or other. A, lang a language is more than just its dictionary. Right? If I gave you a dictionary of French and said, okay, go ahead and speak French, you wouldn't know what to do. And it's the same thing with Klingon. So it's not just a list of words. So I had to figure out what the grammar was going to be. Well, what does that mean? That means the basic word order. Are there going to be prefixes and suffixes? Are there going to be tenses and plurals and all that kind of thing? And I honestly, at this point, don't remember what I did first or how I decided what when. But I do remember some of the thinking that went into what, what I chose to do. So for example, the basic order of the words I had to figure out. Uh, the, sort of the three basic elements in a, in, a, in a sentence are the subject, the verb, and the object. The subject is who's doing the action, the verb is what is the action, and the object is who's receiving the action, assuming that that's appropriate to the sentence. It doesn't have to be there. So in English, this is the order. The subject, and then the verb, and, and then the object. Dogs bite people. Dogs are the, the things doing the action, bite is the action, people are the recipients of the action. In English, if you take those same words and put them in reverse order, people bite dogs, it means something totally different, even though the words are exactly the same. So part of the grammar of English is, is knowing where in the sentence does the subject fall and where does the object fall. Otherwise, you don't know who's doing what to whom most of the time. It's a little more complicated than that. Uh, anyway, if you look around at all the different languages, there's all kinds of different orders these things can fall in. It doesn't have to be the way English is. And in fact, in some languages, it can be any old thing because you mark who's doing it by little suffixes or something like that. But ignoring that for the time being, mathematically, for these three elements, there's six possible combinations. In other words, there's the subject, verb, object. It could be subject, object, verb. It could be verb, object, subject, verb, subject, object. Object, subject, verb, object, verb, subject. But mathematically, there's six of these things. And all of these things are represented in languages in the world somewhere or other. However, some of them are a lot more common 
than others. So if you take this weird notion that the most common are the most human and the least common are the least human, then for Klingon, I should pick the least common, not because of any other reason than it's found in the, uh, the fewest human languages. And the least common are these, the ones with the object first. And this one here is the one I chose for Klingon that's found in a few languages in the world, not very many, as the basic word order. Uh, but because it's so uncommon in the world, that made it a good candidate for the basic word order for Klingon, which is not of this world. I had to decide what to do about the pronouns and had to decide whether it's just going to be independent words, like in English, I, you, he, she, or there's going to be suffixes or prefixes or something like in some other languages, or both. And I decided on both. So there are independent pronouns in Klingon that mean I, you, and so forth. But also with every verb, there's a little prefix that tells you who the object is, who the subject is. Um, and what I did is modeled after some languages, actually uh, from the Himalayas, and put those th notions together. So a single prefix could mean the subject if, by itself, or it could mean the subject and the object together. So for example, I do something to you, I'm sorry, I, I do something to him, I do something to her, the little prefix is vi, and then the verb comes after that. Uh, now that's different from this, because it's not an independent word, so the subject's, the, the, the prefix part it is, is independent of the independent words, if that makes any sense. I do something to you is ka, if I write that way, qa, it means I do something to you. Neither of this means I or you all by itself together, it means I do something to you. So all the, all the prefixes work like that. Uh, if, if he does something to her or she does something to him, then there's no prefix at all. So the absence of a prefix is meaningful as well, and so forth. Uh, for an imperative, a command, do it. Uh, do it to him, do it to it, do it to her, is ye. I had to make decisions about, are there going to be tenses? Are there going to be plurals and all that stuff? So I just, I just arbitrarily made these decisions. And what I did as I was going along doing it is, is I made notes. I wrote it down. I kept track of what I was doing. So every time a new sentence would come along in the script, I'd say, OK, there's a plural there. How did I do plural before? Do it the same way, and so on. Kept track, kept track, kept track. Every once in a while, doing that would lead to something that I didn't like. I said, oh, this is crummy. I'm following my own rules, but it's crummy. That's OK. No one has ever heard this language before. I can change it, as long as I change it everywhere in the same way. So the thing was changing as I was going along, too. And eventually what I did is I came up with Klingon translations for all the lines of dialogue in the film, where it said the character spoke the line in Klingon. And I had to write them out phonetically so that the actors could learn the lines. And in addition to writing them out phonetically, I also uh, made tapes, like Berlitz language learning tapes, for the actors so that they could listen to them and learn their lines. And the actors actually told me afterwards that they took their little cassette tapes and put them in their car cassette players would drive down the Hollywood freeway practicing speaking Klingon and hopefully avoiding accidents. I went to Hollywood and I was on the set most of the time when the actors were speaking Klingon. Not 100% of the time. There's a few lines that they did before I got there and a few lines I did after I left, but most of the time I was there. So I would work with the actors every day and practice the lines and say the lines and so forth. Uh, the main speaker of Klingon in this film is Christopher Lloyd, who plays Krug. And every day we would sit down in the morning and go over the lines for that day. And just before each take, we would rehearse the lines back and forth and get it right. And he was very enthusiastic and, and, and you know, really wanted to get it right. And he did, a, he did an incredible job. My sort of role model of what Klingon sounds like is Christopher Lloyd saying it, because he was my first big speaker. Uh, and in the course of the filming, it was very interesting because at the end of every take in, a, in, in making any film, the director yells cut and checks with the, with the camera guy, was that okay for you? Checks with the sound guy, was that okay for you? But in this case, he would also check with me. Leonard Nimoy would check with me. Was the, was the Klingon okay? And if it sounded okay, I'd say yes. And if it didn't sound okay because someone said the wrong thing, left a syllable out, changed the vowel or something, I'd say no. Well, I learned very quickly not to say no very often. And we only redid it for the Klingon if something, something was really, really sounded funny. And a couple of times, Leonard himself 
would reshoot the scene because the Klingon sounded funny to him because he got picked up an ear for the language as well. And at one time, someone said a line uh, which, after it was said, Leonard said, no, 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 that sounds too much like French. And he was right because Klingon is very sort of choppy. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, a line like, jont ta, jont ta is, is the, the engine uh, of the ship. But if you say, you don't say jont ta, jont ta, jont ta. It has to be choppy like that. And, and if it's said wrong, it doesn't sound like Klingon. But most of the time, we, we would let it go. Now, if the actor said it in a way different from what I had intended, but it still sounded like good, Kling, like good Klingon, I'd say, OK. And I'd make a note to myself, OK, I wanted him to say tu, but he said to. I would change my little dictionary. So from now on, that word became to. That became the correct way to do it. Sometimes, it wasn't, it, it's not only the sounds of the language that got changed as a result of the, of the actors getting the line wrong or something like that or not remembering correctly. Sometimes the grammar itself changed. Uh, so for example, there's, there's, a, there's a scene in the film where Commander Krug says, kill one of them, I don't care which one. All right, now, the way you say that in Klingon, or the way that I had devised to say that in Klingon, is kill one of them, the object comes first, so the first thing is one, wa, means one, and then the command, kill. Okay, there's a little prefix, ye, that tells you it's a command. And the word for kill is hoch, which I write this way. The big, the big H's is the ch sound. So wa, ye hoch, kill one of them. One imperative, kill. I don't care which one. Vai, uh, that means somebody, anybody, then I don't care. Jishachbe. J means I. Shach means to be concerned about. Be means not. J means I. Shach means to be concerned about, to care about. Be means not. So I don't care. Yachoch. Jishachbe. Yachoch. Jishachbe. Leonard yells, cut, that was a great take. Christopher Lloyd says, I blew it. And he says, what do you mean? He says, I said the Klingon wrong. And he did. He left off the wa, and he left off the vi. Leonard Nimoy says, Mark, how did the Klingon sound to you? And I knew that the correct answer is, it sounded fine. And in fact, it did sound fine. It sounded like perfectly good Klingon. Grammatically, it wasn't what I had in mind, but it sounded fine. So what I did in order to make it work is just on the spot, change the grammar a little bit. And the way the main change I made was with this prefix ye. Originally, ye meant this is an imperative, this is a command. But now, you only use the ye prefix if you're giving a command and the object is singular. So yehoch has to mean kill one. Because you use a different prefix, which I hadn't made up yet, if you mean kill more than one. So you don't need the wa. That's superfluous. That's extra. So suddenly, what Christopher Lloyd said is grammatically just fine. So the grammar changed there. What occurred to me as I was doing all this, with the sounds changing, with, with the grammar changing, is that language was, was growing. My language was growing and developing and changing at an incredibly rapid pace. It was like the Genesis planet was having an effect on the language itself. So it came in in one form, and by the time it went through this whole Genesis planet thing, it came out a little differently. It did the same thing that real languages do. It did it a lot faster. But real languages grow and change as a result of speaking it, and so did Klingon. They decided that some lines that were originally spoken in English should really be spoken in Klingon. Now I had to match lip movements, English lip movements, to the Klingon words. But it also had to match my vocabulary and grammar and sounds. It couldn't just be a nice phonetic and, 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 and you know, lip syncing match. A little more complicated than that. So for example, one of the words is the word animal. So I had to come up with a Klingon word or Klingon phrase that sounded different, but whose lip movements were looked the same or looked very close. So what I came up with is Hattebach, animal. Hattebach, animal. It looks the same. One of the things that I kept thinking about as I was making up the language for the film is, are people going to understand it at all? What's going to happen if the line comes up with no subtitles at all? Are they going to buy into all this? 
And there's one line in the film that comes up twice, the first time with the subtitle and the second time without. And that's how, when I first saw the film, that's how I knew that it was working. Mark! Cho-y-choo! Later on, towards the end of the film, Kirk, having defeated Krug, is on the planet with Spock. Mark! But when I saw it with that audience in New York, the audience applauds and cheers. They understood the line, which means the language means the language is working. Okay, it was, it was an incredibly satisfying moment. Okay.